I run to you? Do you know of anything, anyone, that you could run to that would be like your Father in heaven? He is our strength. He is our tower. He is our deliverer. He is everything to us. That's what we need to remember. When we have something, run to our Father in heaven. I run to you. When I need a father, when I need a friend, I run to you. I run to you. You give me joy. thing we think about doing, isn't it? And yet God tells us we're to bring all things to Him. There's nothing too small, nothing inconvenient for His time that He doesn't care about us to hear from. The Bible says this, in fact, that we're to cast all our cares on Him because He cares for us. That's running to God. As we continue to worship this morning, there will be several of us up here. We'd be honored to pray with you, whatever it may be that you'd like to pray about. As we continue to worship in song, Maybe there's something you'd like to pray about that we'd be honored to pray with you. Yeah. 
Well, good morning again. Good morning. Again. It is uh, good to be back. We want to dismiss our kids for Kids Quest at this time, so kids, you're welcome to go. Somebody asked me last time what Kids Quest was, and I said that's what when Bill gets up and he leaves. Um, but he's not here to make fun of this morning, so this is kind of fun. But uh, Kids Quest is our, our children's church, and sometimes our parents have our kids stay here in the service as well. Either option is a good option. It's your choice, whatever you want to do. It is good to be back. And you are a little lopsided this morning, so if I <laughs> preach over here, don't feel like I'm ignoring you over there. But if I go over here, don't feel like I'm ignoring you over there. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are God of grace. A grace that is so deep and far and wide that we can't begin to understand. But my prayer this morning, Lord, is that you would deepen our experience of your grace. Help us to understand, Lord, that you are greater than our fears. And that by your grace, you have made yourself known to us. And by your grace, you have equipped us to live a life that we break free from the tyranny and the bondage of fear and live in the freedom and the joy and the peace and the security that faith in you brings. Mm. Father, I pray strengthen our understanding of that this morning, that as we leave from here today, Lord, we will be relieved from the fears that we came in here carrying. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, I want to begin this morning with giving you a short true or false quiz. And I want you to keep score of your answers as we walk through this short quiz. And in the end, we'll grade this quiz together and we'll see how well you actually did. You ready? True or false, <coughs> real Christians do not wrestle with fear. True or false, real Christians are free from the expectations of others. True or false, Christians are shielded from trials and hardships and suffering. True or false, Real Christians never struggle with God's ability to keep His promises. True or false? Real Christians are never insecure in God's forgiveness. Well, how'd you do? You see, if you answered true to any of those, you got it wrong. Because the answer to all five of them are false. And the reason I give you that quiz is because many people have the idea that if you're a sincere follower of Christ, you'll be free from the heart-pounding grip of fear, from the straitjacket expectations of others. That if you're a genuine believer, you'll be shielded from the trials, the hardships, the suffering that life brings. That you'll never suffer from doubt or failure. But the truth is, there could be nothing further from the truth. I appreciate the words of seasoned pastor and author Charles Swindoll who fills back the veneer of our well-intentioned but misguided notions about the Christian life. Listen to what he says. He says, These false expectations lead to disappointment. Disappointment in others, disappointment in themselves, and disappointment with God. Now listen to what he says. The truth is, that the authentic life of faith is a constant battle against temptations. It is marked by stumbling, falling, and getting back up. Dirtied and bruised. True believers can be bothered by lingering doubts or jolted by unbelief. They fail their friends, their families, and fellow believers. They back down when they should stand up. They lose hope when they should look to the Lord in confidence. You see, the Bible never paints a picture of the Christian life as being problem-free or stress-free. In fact, when we look at the Bible, the people of God are just as vulnerable to the same struggles, setbacks, and disappointments as anyone else. So that being said, if you came here this morning feeling like your life of faith is a constant battle against temptations... Marked by stumbling and falling, dirtied and bruised, guess what? You are in good company. 
And you may have come here this morning feeling like your gas tank of faith is working on fumes. You're not alone. The person sitting next to you is struggling in the same way you are. Well, this morning I want to look at one of the most lethal and hard-hitting struggles that every one of us as believers deal with on an almost daily basis. Fear. It manifests itself in a garden variety of ways. Anxiety, dread, worry, distress, unease, unrest. It doesn't matter what you call it. The effects are still the same. Fear has a way of pounding in our hearts, surging its paralyzing poison to every part of our lives. Fear. So, what's the answer? The Bible says this, that the answer to all your fears is God. Amen. Because when you come to understand who the God of the Bible is, this omnibenevolent, that is all good God, this omnipotent, that is all powerful, this omniscient, that is all knowing, and this omnipresent, that is all present God, when you understand who the God of the Bible is, you begin to realize, I have nothing to fear, that the answer to all my fears is God. But there's just one problem. Do you really believe that? I mean, do you operate that way on a daily basis? Why is it that you still struggle with fear? Why is that? You see, there's a big difference between knowing something is true in your mind and believing that it is true in your heart. So how do you align your mind and your heart together, your beliefs and your convictions? One word. Faith. Faith is the connecting link between our minds and our hearts. So with that in mind, what I want you to do is turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is what we call the great hall of faith chapter. It recounts the lives of men and women of old who have walked with God, have earned His acceptance by their faith, and through walking in faith, have endured, have overcome, have met challenge after challenge and won the victory over them because of their faith in an all-loving, all-powerful, sovereign God. So this morning we're going to look at verses 23 through 28, six verses. And interesting that we're going to look at one of the illustrations of this passage, Moses who I think, aside from Abraham, is perhaps the most significant personage in this chapter. And we're going to see why that is as we unpack these verses together. But I want you to look at verses 23 through 28 with me, and I'm going to read through these verses, and then we're going to unravel these verses and come to terms with how do these verses help us wrestle with our deepest and darkest fears. Verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin considering the reproach of Christ greater than riches, than the treasures of heaven. For he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Six verses. All of them are surrounding the figure of Moses. And what I want us to notice from the beginning here is that he chose Moses, the author of Hebrews, very intentionally because of the people that he's writing to revered Moses as the great law giver. 
And what he's saying in these opening verses about Moses is that I want you to understand that Moses was a man of faith who gained God's approval through his faith and not by the law. But there's something else I want you to see in these verses. They give us what I would say a four-step practical process of facing our fears with faith. In these verses, I see four different steps that we can take. One is to resist what keeps you from following God's will. There are things in your life that are trying to be roadblocks, that are trying to thwart you from following God's will. Resist them. Two, renounce the false expectations of others, the world and friends, family, the culture we live in will try to impose its expectations on you to say, shape up or ship out. Become like one of us. And you must come to a crossroads of decision. And that crossroads will lead you to a place of saying, I renounce the expectations of the world and embrace those fully of God instead. Three, to remember God has a sovereign plan for your life. It may seem kind of interesting, but we can easily lose sight of that in our failures and our blunders of life and think that somehow God has given up on us. But this passage is going to remind us no matter how great the blunder, no matter how deep the failure, God says, I have a plan for your life. I have never given up on it. And four, rest in God's grace. So re resist, renounce, remember, and rest. Let's look at all these, these four steps. First of all, resist what keeps you from following God's will. Resist what keeps you from following God's will. One of the greatest roadblocks that you're going to face in your life is fear. Fear that tries to manifest itself in such a way that it will appear logical, it will appear rational, it will appear, it'll, it'll appear intimidating, and it will attempt to thwart you from following God's will. We see that in the opening verse of verse 23. Listen to what it says. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now this faith is not Moses' faith personally, but it does impact him. This faith is his parents' faith. And it says that when they saw Moses, when he was born, he was so beautiful, there was something about him that they did not fear the king's edict, but instead they chose to allow the baby to live. Moses was born perhaps during Israel's darkest history of fear. The children of Israel had been in the land of Egypt now for centuries. And in the beginning, they had been welcomed with wide open arms by Egypt. Why? Because a Hebrew by the name of Joseph had literally rescued the nation of Egypt from starvation and ruin. And they open armed welcomed Joseph into Egypt, him and his family, all 70. But as time went on, Joseph's family grew stronger and Egypt's memory grew weaker. Then there came the day when a pharaoh rose up who did not know Joseph or the history of Egypt. And he looked out across his land and he saw a growing massive number of Hebrews. Exodus chapter 1 verse 12 says that when he saw this growing, swelling number of Hebrews, his, his heart was filled with a sickening dread. Fear began to consume this great ruler's heart. And he quickly realized that he must do something to subdue this mighty nation before they take over his land. And he comes up with a plan, and that plan is very simple. Infanticide. Kill every newborn Hebrew boy. So he tells the Hebrew midwives, he says, listen, here's my plan. Every time a Hebrew woman is going to give birth to a child and you see that it's a boy, I want you to kill him. Right there on the spot, the moment that child is born, kill him. Well, the Hebrew midwives decide that they're going to follow God instead of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh soon realizes that his plan has backfired because all the Hebrew boys' children are, children are still being born. 
And he goes to the midwives and he says, hey, what gives here? Didn't I give you a clear directive? Kill all the male Hebrew boys. In a very clever way, they say, well, listen, Pharaoh, these Hebrew women, they're amazing. I mean, they no sooner go into labor, the baby's there. I mean, that baby is born so fast, but by the time we hear it's in the birth process, we get there and he's already born. We can't help that. So he realizes this plan isn't going to work. Then he comes up with a new plan. He decides at this point then, okay, if you're going to work against me rather than with me, I give the decree then that every Hebrew boy will be thrown into the Nile and fed to the crocodiles. It is interesting to me as we look at this brief passage and we are reminded of, of Israel's history in Egypt that fear was the driving force behind Pharaoh. In his cruelest and bloodiest decisions against the Hebrews, it was fear that was the driving motive. It's interesting when you look at world history and you find the, the bloodiest, the cruelest of all the leaders. If you look at their heart and you find the seed, what was the motive? What was the compelling, driving emotion behind that? You'll find more often than not, it was fear. Fear. Well, as the story goes on, <clears throat> uh, this one day young married couple by the name of Abraham and Jacob had realized that they're about to have their third child. Now, it's important. Their third child. They already have a daughter. They already have a son. But now they realize they have a third child on the way, and they feel the strange sense of both delight and dread. Delight, if it's a girl, delight. If it's, if it's a boy, then that is dread. Well, the day comes and the baby is born, and sure enough, it is a boy. And the moment they see this baby boy, there is something that is, that is attractive, something that is beautiful, it says in verse 23. Exodus chapter 2, verse 2 uses the same word, the word beautiful, meaning there is something astounding, something that, that was a, a extraordinary about this baby. Now, I have to tell you, as a parent, I read this passage and I go, you tell me one parent that doesn't have that response every time their child is born. When I saw our girls, I thought these are the most beautiful kids that have ever been born in the world. So, what was it about Moses that made him attractive in a distinctive way to his parents? The Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in the first century, says that God gave Amram a vision that his son would raise up and deliver the nation of Egypt or Israel from bondage. Whether it happened or not, we don't know, but somehow they saw this baby boy when he was born. They realized there was something very special about this boy. And so they decide to keep him. And the moment they do, they put themselves between this unrelenting vice of crushing distress. You see, in keeping the baby, they choose the hard road. Or so it appears on the outside. Now they could have chosen easily to have gotten rid of the baby and obey Pharaoh. Or they could have chosen to keep the baby and obey God. They of course choose to obey God. And they keep him for three months. Now I want you to imagine, put yourself in the sandals of, of Amram and Jochebed just for a moment. Imagine if you had a Hebrew baby boy and you knew that you weren't supposed to. But you had him anyhow and you have him in your home for three months. What do little babies do? Well, you know what they do. They cry. And so for three long, solid months, Amram and Jochebed are living on pins and needles. There is no rest, no reprieve. They are awake constantly. They sleep lighter than a feather. The moment Moses begins to make any noise, they are there. Shh. You see, they were the very definition of a helicopter parent. <laughs> so fear of being found out relentlessly consumed their every moment, sleeping and waking. No rest, no reprieve from the pressure. But the Bible says that they, says that they were not afraid of the king's edict. They refused to obey Pharaoh. 
And that is they gladly embrace the risk of losing their own lives to spare the third child's life. Now I want you to listen to the logic here of what is taking place. Because we see this in modern times. That whenever fear comes into your life to disobey God, it can manifest itself in a very logical, very rational way that, it, gee, it only makes sense to do this. Now, they could have very easily reasoned something like this. Hey, you know what? We already have two children. What if something happens to us? Who will raise them? For their sake, it makes sense, doesn't it? To get rid of this baby. And besides, what kind of world are we bringing this child into? He would be better off dead than to suffer. You see, fear pressures us to disobey God in such a way that it will always have a logical bent to it, a rational sense to it. But the author wants us to see something very important. <clears throat> And that faith means resisting your fears. No matter how intimidating, no matter how logical, no matter how rational they may seem. Faith means resisting your fears. It says that they chose to disobey the king's edict. At the risk of their lives. At the risk of their children's lives. At the risk of lives around them. At the risk of greater danger than just simply getting rid of a baby. They chose not to fear the king's edict. Why is that? Faith. By faith, it says, they chose to disobey the king's edict. Do you remember what faith is? The author told us in the opening verses, chapter 11, verse 1, he said, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it men of old were approved. What is that verse saying in application to Moses' parents? It's saying that Moses' parents saw the unseen God and they believed in the God of the Bible. That He is omnibenevolent. He is all good. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is omniscient. He is all knowing. He is omnipresent. He is all present. And therefore they put their faith in this God. And they knew that He was the answer to their fears. That He is a sovereign and good and loving God. And therefore they chose to obey God and not a passing Pharaoh. Could you imagine how this must have impacted Moses as he grew up? Learning who his mother and father were do you know who your mom and dad are, Moses? Amram and Jochebed. Everybody knows who they are. They risked everything for you because of their faith in God. Could you imagine the impact that had on Moses' life as he was growing up as a young man? I know it had to have a tremendous impact on him. You see, the faith that you display as parents for your children will have an impact on the generations to come. And may it be said of us that we were like Amram and Jochebed, that we chose to trust God irrespective of the consequences. So what the author wants us to first see is that when you're dealing with fear, you must learn to resist whatever it is, whatever roadblock, however intimidating as it may be, whatever it may be that is keeping you from doing God's will, resist it and do God's will, even if it means your life. <laughs> Second, renounce false expectations. You see, right, wrong, or otherwise... Our lives, much of our lives, are shaped and directed by the expectations of others, aren't they? Many of the decisions you make today are the result of the expectations that have shaped you from your parents, from your family, from friends, from your spouse, from employers, from your culture. 
the world is ready and willing to enforce its expectations, to squeeze you into its mold. But the question that you and I as believers must come to terms with is this, whose expectations should I live by? And which ones can I be certain are right? None of us wants to come to the end of our lives, at the end of the ladder, having climbed every rung to the very top, only to realize the ladder is against the wrong wall. Mm. So which ones can I be certain are right? It seems that Moses had learned well from his parents, because somewhere during his 40 years, he realized that he was not in fact an Egyptian, but a Hebrew, and he made a radically life-changing decision to live by God's expectations. Verses 24 through 26 explain this to us. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he's 40 years old now, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 25, choosing rather to be to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. 26, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Moses fully renounced the expectations that the world, that Pharaoh, had imposed on him and chose instead to fully embrace God's. That was a tremendous act of faith. Do you remember Moses' early life? He was a young man who grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth. He had it all. He went to the finest Ivy League schools. He was the prince of the mightiest nation on the face of the earth. He personally knew all the big names. He'd met them down at Starbucks and had coffee with them. He could drop names like, well, he in fact himself was a celebrity. They probably said, you know who I had lunch with today? Moses. Oh, really? Yeah. I know him well. Here's a guy who had it all. One of the early teachers of the Bible, F.B. Meyer, describes Moses' place in high society of Egypt this way. He says, if he rode in the forth in the streets, he would be in a prince, it would be in princely equipage amid cries of bow to the knee. If he floated the Nile, he would be in a golden barge amid strains of luxurious music. If he wished for aught, the most illimitable wealth of the treasure of Egypt was within his reach. He had it all. And yet he chose to say it is not worth it. Because God reminded him somewhere along the way, he spoke unto his life and he said, listen Moses, you're not an Egyptian. You're a Hebrew. You're a son of Abraham. You're a child of God. Somewhere, somehow, God spoke this into his life, and Moses listened. He listened. Despite the amazing pressures around him to conform to the riches, to the wealth, to the expectations of royalty, he chose instead to say no. He understood something that many of us never fully grasp. That no matter how abundant your wealth, no matter what platform of prestige or power or pleasure you may experience in your life, it is passing. It is temporary. Moses understood that prestige and power, the pleasures of sin, are like eating Chinese food. No matter how much you eat, two hours later, you're hungry again. You know, trying to live up to the expectations of the world is really an invitation, isn't it? It's an invitation to a life of insecurity, instability, and fear. It's an invitation to a life of misery, as I see it. But one of the major reasons that many believers are suffer or are trapped in the bondage of insecurity and fear and instability 
is this reason. Because they don't know whose they are, therefore they don't know who they are. You say, what did you say? Let me say it again. That one of the reasons that we as believers, that you as a believer in Christ struggle with insecurity, you struggle with instability, you struggle with fear, is because you don't know whose you are, therefore you don't know who you are. You see, God reminded Moses whose he was and therefore who he was. He belonged to God. And therefore, he knew who he was. He was a Hebrew. And God had a plan for his life. God had called him to live by his expectations, not Pharaoh's, not Egypt's, not the world's. When you know whose you are, then you know who you are, and it can radically change your life. Let me just say this to you. The Bible says this, if you're a believer in Christ, whose you are changed from literally night and day, from hell and heaven. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, the moment you cross that line of faith, the moment you trusted Christ, you were transported from the kingdom of Satan into God's kingdom. Amen. That you now belong to God. That you're now a new creation. That your life is hidden with Christ at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That through your faith in Christ, you're an eternal son and daughter of God. You belong to God. Amen. And when we know who we are, then we'll know whose we are. And when we know whose we are, we know who we are. Does that make sense? Yep. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen? You see, we have not been called, you have not been called to live by the expectations of the world around you, to be conformed into its passing pleasures of sin. Moses understood this. But the question for you and I is this. Are you going to let the world tell you who you are? Or are you going to let God tell you who you are? Or let me pose this question another way. Do you want to live a life of insecurity and fear, short-lived gain? Then live according to the world's expectations. But if you want to live a life of lasting security, stability, peace, and joy, then learn to live by God's expectations. Isn't that so contradictory to what the world would have you believe about Christianity? Mm -hmm. The world would have you to believe that if you're a follower of Christ, oh man, you're missing out. What a bummer. <laughs> and for us as believers who have stepped across that line of faith and realized the freedom, the peace, the joy, the forgiveness that we have in Christ, we go, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Just what are you talking about? Oh man, you can't go do this and you can't go do that and you can't do this and... And you say, well, why would I? It's like eating Chinese food. I'll be hungry two hours later. And it does me no good. The passing pleasures of sin will never satisfy your soul. Only living by God's expectations. Why? Because your soul was made for God. And when you live in conformity and relationship with Him, you learn to love God first and foremost. And when you learn to love God first and foremost, you find your soul's desires and expectations satisfied in a way the world could never satisfy. Amen. The question is, whose expectations are you going to live by? Now, I would be remiss if I were to say this is an easy decision, decision because it comes with great risk. This decision to radically alter from the world and choose to be embraced by God's expectations cost Moses enormously. And it will cost you enormously. It will cost you, perhaps, your reputation, your job, your friendships, your home. It cost Moses all of these and more. And yet he was willing to say, you know, I'm going to give it all up. My reputation, my job, my titles, my prestige, my wealth, my friendships, my home, everything I've ever known, I'm willing to give it up to embrace God's expectations for my life. Don't ever believe that being a follower of Christ is easy. It can be the most riskiest, challenging decision you've ever made in your life. But I assure you this. 
there is no greater reward than to follow Christ. Amen. Not only in the here and now, but guaranteed in time to come. Moses refused to live by the false expectations of others. He considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. You see, Moses understood what Abraham understood and what we must understand. Some now, but more later. Some now, but more later. A number of weeks ago, I was preaching through this same chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, and Jack DeMars was sitting right there in the middle of the pew about in the middle of the church. And somehow as I was sharing about some now and more later, I looked up and we locked eyes. Mm. For the last three years of his life, his health has been dwindling quickly. And Bill is right in every sense of the word. Here is a man of incredible faith. He knows in days, in days, his life will be done. And yet he told me yesterday, he said, I'm not the least bit worried, John. I'm ready. I'm ready. Mm. I'm ready. A couple of Sundays ago, I preached again on this passage, and Jack said in the first service, and then as he was walking out, he turned around and came right back again. He says, I'm going to sit through that again. Aww. God was using this time to strengthen his faith. And I pray that God uses this time to strengthen your faith in His Word, in Christ, so that you take this home and you never, never, never forget it. Amen. Because there will be a day, there will be a time, and I assure you, it will come. That you must decide, how am I going to respond to the fear of death? And I pray that we are like Jack. That every single person that walks into that room walks away staggered with amazement at the faith that this man has. And may God look into our lives. May the world look at our lives and say, there goes a man, a woman, a child of faith. We need to resist the pressures and the false expectations of the world around us. That's what faith does in renouncing our fears. Realizing that a life of faith means some now, but oh, so much more later. Third, is to remember God has a sovereign plan for your life. Listen, believer. I don't know who you are, and I don't have to know your life. I don't have to know your experiences. But one thing I assure you of, because I've been there, and so many others, that there are going to be seasons in your life where you're going to walk through the desert. You're going to feel like God put you on a shelf. You're going to feel like God forgot you. You're going to feel like God abandoned you. You're going to feel like that God rejected you. And you're going to seriously wonder, God, do you really have a plan for me? Do you even know who I am? Remember me? I think Moses went through a bit of this. Although we see the flip side of it. Verse 27 says this, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Now I want you to hold on to that phrase in your mind just for a moment. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Moses knew early on that he was a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. He also was sharp enough to realize that it was not by accident that he had become the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That God had a plan for his life. And somehow he understood, somehow it became clear to him that God had chosen him to deliver the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Moses only had one problem. Actually, he had multiple problems, but one problem. And we see this problem not only here, but it surfaces elsewhere in his life and it literally keeps him out of the promised land. Mm -hmm. Impatience. Impatience. I want it now the way I want it and this is the way it should be done. 
We don't have this problem, do we? No. no. <laughs> Exodus 2 tells us the story that Moses was aware that God had called him. He wanted to deliver the nation of Israel from, from bondage. Moses was truly a tremendously gifted individual, extremely talented, highly capable, but very impatient. Exodus, in fact, tells us one day that he was walking along and he saw an Egyptian beating up one of his own kinsmen. I suspect this was not the first time that he'd seen Nazi-like treatment against his own people. And something inside of him snapped. And he said, enough is enough. And he challenged the Egyptian. The, the Egyptian resisted. And somehow in the conflict, whether he intended to or not, he killed the Egyptian. Realizing that he had just snuffed out the life of an Egyptian, he quickly buried the evidence. Apparently didn't do a very good job. Must have left his toes sticking up or something. Because the very next day, there were a couple of Hebrews, and they were quarreling with each other, and Hebrew comes, or Moses comes walking up to him. He says, hey, listen, you guys stop that. Don't you realize who you are? You're Hebrews. You shouldn't be fighting with each other. And they respond back to him. They say, well, who made you ruler? Are you going to snuff out our lives like you did that Egyptian? And it says in Exodus chapter 2, verse 14, <clears throat> Moses was filled with fear. Moses was afraid. He immediately understood that Pharaoh, who was the most powerful man on the face of the earth, was seeking his life. Something had seriously gone awry with Moses' plans. <clears throat> you see, his best made efforts had made an absolute miserable mess of things. And now he had a corpse on his hands. You ever done that before in your life? Been so convinced that God has a plan for your life. Yes, I need to go this way to make this decision. I need to make this effort. Whatever it may be, this is God's plan for my life. And the moment you try to unravel this plan and make it a reality, something snaps, something breaks, and everything falls apart in front of you, and you're left with a corpse on your hands, and you go, oh my God, what have I just done? Now, nah, you've never been there. Okay. Well, you probably don't know what that's like. <laughs> But Moses made a royal mess of his life. Exodus chapter 2 verse 14 says that he was afraid. You know, something interesting in this passage that as I read Exodus chapter 2, then I read uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 26, it says that, that uh, pardon me, verse 27, it says that he left Egypt not fearing the edict of the king. Now I kind of scratch my head at this and I go, okay, wait now. The author of Hebrews was a Jew. Had he ever read Exodus chapter 2? Did he even know that it says in 2.14 that Moses was afraid? Is he contradicting Scripture here? Not at all. The author of Hebrews had a profound mastery of the Old Testament. He knew exactly what he was saying. And what he's really doing for us is he's offering a commentary on what was happening in Moses' heart in Exodus chapter 2. Of course, his pulse increased. His heart pounded hard. Of course, he had the sense of anxiety around him, maybe jumping at every noise. You would too. Mm -hmm. If the most powerful ruler on the face of the earth sent his mercenaries out after you. But what the author is saying is this. That the most powerful thing that was driving Moses was not fear, but rather faith. Faith. You see, Moses understood something that his parents had understood. It says that he endured as seeing him who is unseen. The word endured is what unlocks this passage. He understood the faith of his mother and father. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That is, faith is the assurance and the conviction and the unseen God that He is sovereign, He is loving, He is all-powerful, and He has a plan for my life, and it will happen. Moses understood this. Yeah, he made a few blunders. He messed up. But he continued on. He never gave up. 
What was it in Moses' life when he was 80 years old? And many of us are familiar if you've read Exodus chapter 3. Moses gives five plaintive excuses to God why he's not the right guy. Listen, God, I'm 80 years old now. And, you know, I had plans to go on a Caribbean cruise just next Wednesday. And after that, I'm going to go to Hawaii. And then next fall, I'm going to go down to Arizona. I've got plans, God. I'm going to retire and take it easy. You've probably read Exodus chapter 3. It doesn't say those things, does it? But he gave five excuses as to why he wasn't the right guy. But he responded. And there was something in Moses that he understood about God that I want us to understand about God as well. That when God has a plan for your life, he never gives up on that plan. Let me give you a couple of verses that I want you to tuck away in your memory. That no matter how bleak or how discouraging or difficult things look on the outside, I want you to remember God's Word promises He has a plan for your life. No matter how long the wait, no matter how dry the desert, no matter how abandoned you feel, God has a plan for your life. He's promised. The first one is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And the second is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, both in the same book. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says this, He chose us in Him, that is, God chose believers in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. Do you hear what Paul is saying? The Apostle Paul is saying this, that before time, matter, and energy, before creation came into being, God looked out to the corridors of history and He saw you and He said, I choose you. And I'm going to make you holy and blameless. Now, why is that so important? This happened before creation, before time, matter, and energy exploded into being. Why is that so important? Because we often base our relationship with God based on our performance. And when we fail, we blunder, we mess up, we go, oh God... I really messed up now. There's no way you could love me. There's no way you can accept me. There's no way you can use me. And God says, hey, do you remember what I told you in my word? Do you know why I said it that way? I said it that way intentionally because I knew that one day you would hit a wall. And you'd say, you know, this wall is my fault. It's my failure, my mistakes. And God, I can't see how you could possibly use me ever again. And so I gave you this verse to remind you that when you hit that wall of failure, of blunder, of pitfalls, of difficulties, of discouragement, I want you to remember, I chose you from eternity past, not based on your performance, but based on my character, based on my love for you. And I will make you holy and blameless. Never forget that. Moses understood that somehow. But there's another verse, and that is this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. <laughs> Listen to what Paul says For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works. Now, listen to when God did this. We are his workmanship, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. This verse is saying that God planned your life. He tailor-shaped the days you live in. Don't you ever sometimes think, you know, I wish I lived back in the early 1900s, the 1800s, the 1700s. Man, they had it made. No, they didn't. Who are you trying to fool? But more importantly... The reason you live in the day, the time, the place that you live now, because this was part of God's sovereign plan in your life. Amen. And He created you, and He hand-tailored a plan for your life that came directly from His office, from His desk. And He stayed up until the wee hours of the night, writing out, here's what I want so-and-so's life to be like, and here are the plans, here are the good works I'm preparing for them. Before you even knew there was such a thing, God already planned your life out. This verse is saying that God planned good works for us to accomplish before you had any idea about them. It removes any fear or doubt that God does not have a plan for our lives. I 
Listen. I know what it is like to feel like God has given up on you. I know what it is like to feel that you've blown it so bad. You've gone so far off the deep end that you say, God, there's no way you could ever use me. And I felt like the worst sinner that ever lived. But when I came to Christ and I came to His grace, I realized He already knew that. That's why He went to the cross. He already knew that. That's why He chose me before the foundations of the earth. He already knew that. That's why He created good works for me to do beforehand. And after that. God has a plan for your life. And no matter how dismal, no matter how dark or discouraging you may feel, discouraged you may feel, remember that God has a sovereign plan for your life. And trust Him for that, would you? Trust Him. Finally, and this is perhaps the most important of all, when we deal with fear in our lives, the most important step we could ever take is to learn, listen, to learn to rest in God's grace. Let me just say it, friend. Do I understand this word grace that I'm saying? No, I don't. <laughs> have I experienced it? Oh, yes, I have. Mm -hmm. Do I understand it? No, I don't. Have I experienced it? Yes, I have. Do you understand it? No, you don't. Have you experienced it? Yes, you are. You see, grace is something that God wants us to learn because He is a God of grace. You look at any other faith, any other belief system in the world, and the history of mankind, they do not understand nor have grace as a part of their vocabulary. Grace is saying that I love you and I forgive you and I'm going to embrace a relationship with you despite the things you've done, despite your failures in your life. I'm going to forgive them. That's called grace. Yeah. Grace is undeserved favor from God. Well, verse 28 says that Moses understood this grace. And this is significant because Moses is the great lawgiver. Moses is the one who enforced the black and the white, the letters of here's how you live according to God's will. But Moses understood something long before God ever gave the law. He understood it meant to rest in God's grace. And that's what verse 28 tells us. By faith, listen, he, Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Now Moses is 80 years of age. He comes back into Egypt and he says, Listen, Pharaoh, it's time to let my people go. Then as they're getting ready to leave, after miracle, after miracle, after miracle, plague, after plague, after plague, it says, by faith, Moses kept the Passover. Now, why is this so significant? Because Moses, through God's direction, instituted the Passover before the law ever came about. Mm -hmm. Meaning that Moses understood that there had to be a sacrificial lamb for the forgiveness of Israel's sins, for the forgiveness of his own sins. Now, this is so, so, so vital. I want you to get this. You see, the audience that he was writing to, the book of Hebrews, this audience understood better than anybody what substitutional atonement means. An innocent dying in the place of the guilty for the sake of the guilty. Substitutional atonement. And they understood that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. He is the substitutional atonement that God has sent for the forgiveness of sins. They understood that. But here's where their thinking went awry, and you and I do the same thing. They begin to question God, and they begin to go, wait, 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 wait. Is Jesus' sacrifice enough? I mean, is faith alone in Christ enough? Don't I need to keep the law? Is there something more I have to do? I mean, don't I have to go to church every week? Don't I have to get baptized? Don't I have to give a certain amount of money? Don't I have to do certain good works? And Moses is telling us by his life, before the law ever came along, he says, listen, the way you're approved by God is like the men of old who are approved by God, by faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction, not things of things unseen. And he says, by, by it, men of old were approved. 
It has always been by faith that we gain God's acceptance, not by the law. Now, why is this so radically important when we're dealing with our fears? This is amazing. You see, what the author is saying this, you're dealing with fear. But I want you to look at Moses. He understood that faith alone gains God's forgiveness, nothing else. And that's what the Passover lamb really was all about. But you see what Moses was flawed about in the beginning when he was 40? And what the nation of Israel was flawed about as they were about to leave Egypt? Their flaw in their thinking was this. If you were to ask them, what is it that's making you afraid? They would look behind their shoulder and say, it's Egypt. If you were to ask Moses when he was trying to deliver the nation of Israel in the beginning, he'd say, what is it that's making you afraid? What's the king? What Moses needed to understand, what the nation of Israel needed to understand is the real culprit, the real fear monger, the real problem was not Egypt, was not Pharaoh. The real source of their fear was sin. Was sin. And they needed to understand that they needed to be freed from the bondage of their sin before they could be freed from the bondage of Egypt. They didn't understand that. And that only the Passover lamb could do that. He said the real slave driver was sin, not Egypt. Sin was the driving source of their fears, more than Egypt. See, it's sin's enslavement to fear that will keep you from following God's will. It will keep you from knowing, not knowing whose you are, therefore who you are. It will keep you from embracing God's plan. It will keep you from experiencing a life of transforming grace. Sin is our real problem. Not our Egypts, not our Pharaohs, but our sins are the real problem. See, facing our fears with faith means coming to fully rest in God's provision for salvation, His substitutional work that He did through His Son, Jesus Christ, for sinners on the cross. And that is called resting in God's grace. And such a hard thing for us to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're no different than the Hebrew readers who oftentimes ask God under a breath, wasn't there something more I need to do? It can't be this simple. Don't I have to prove myself, God? God says, listen, you already proved yourself and you did a horrible job. <laughs> So give it up and learn to rest in my grace. You see, when we begin to understand what it means to rest in God's grace, we suddenly see, we hear Jesus' words in a whole new light. We hear when Jesus says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, that He said He came to proclaim release to the captives, to set free those who are oppressed. We suddenly hear Jesus saying that He is the rescuer from sin. He is the one that we find release from our fears and the oppression that we struggle with in our lives. And Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, He said, I am the way and the truth. He also said the truth will set you free. See, what Jesus was saying is what Moses' parents understood, what Moses understood is that knowing Him is the answer to all of our fears. Do you know why? Jack DeMars has such confidence and joy and peace and he's not wrestling with fear because he knows that Christ is the answer to all his fears. Amen. Can I ask you, what is it that you're afraid of? You came in here this morning carrying a whole baggage load of fears, didn't you? Fears about your health, fears about finances, fears maybe about the economy, fears maybe about, about relationships, fears maybe about your kids, fears about the world. You came in here carrying a, a whole baggage load of fears. So what is keeping you from fully giving your life up to an all-loving, all-powerful God who wants nothing but the best for you? What's keeping you from doing that? Years ago, I came across a description of fear that hits close to home. It was written by one of my favorite authors, a name 
Some of you will immediately know the moment I say it. And he said it well. He talked about fear. His name was Neil T. Anderson. He said, fear is a thief. It erodes our faith, plunders our hope, steals our freedom, and takes away our joy of living the abundant life in Christ. Phobias, he said, are like coils of a snake. The more we give in to them, the tighter they squeeze. Tired of fighting, we succumb to the temptation and surrender to our fears. But what seemed like an easy way out becomes, in reality, a prison of unbelief. A fortress of fear that holds us captive. Wow. Well said, isn't it? What is it that you're living in fear of right now? Jesus said, I came to deliver you from those fears. What sins are at work in your life that you need to confront and say, God, no more, no more. I'm choosing to live by you and not by my fears or giving into sin. Will you realize today that the answer to all your fears is Jesus Christ? Will you pray with me? I want you to bow your heads with me, and as you do, I want to ask you a very personal question only you can answer between you and God. Have you crossed that line of faith? Have you come to God and recognized that the real Egypt of your life, the real Pharaoh of your life, is not the world around you, but the sins within you. The fears that torment you and hold you in bondage are the real Egypt, the real Pharaoh. But I want to ask you this morning, have you crossed that line of faith? Have you chosen to trust Christ as the only one who can save you, who can deliver you, and rescue from that bondage of fear, the torment of the past. Right now, would you, in your heart, in your mind, would you call out to God and say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that you died on the cross for me, for my sins. And Lord, I believe that you have come to deliver me, to rescue me from the fears that have held me in bondage, that have kept me in depression, that have left me discouraged, that have caused me to not believe your word. I confess them to you right now. And I ask, Lord, would you enable me by the power of your Holy Spirit inside of me to live a life each day of gaining greater and greater and greater freedom from the fears that want to keep me from living the abundant life in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for all of us here this morning as believers. We all come here this morning at various levels of our walk with you. Maybe some of us have walked a year, and some have walked 20 years or 30 years. Maybe some began that walk just a few moments ago. But irrespective of where we're at, Lord, I pray that you would guard and guide us in the days in front of us, reminding us again, Lord, that you are greater than all of our fears. And that when fear throws up its intimidating and roaring head as a lion, Lord, that we would be reminded that you are greater than our fears. And we would resist and renounce and remember and rest in your grace. Thank you, Jesus, in your strong name. Amen. Amen. You can stand with me, our last sound is, oh Lord, you're beautiful.
you leave from here today, let me leave you with a verse from Romans 15, 13, and with a challenge. <laughs> Romans 15, 13 is a prayer that the Apostle Paul gives. It is one of my favorite prayers. And I pray this for all of us. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that God's hope and peace are strong in your days. Amen. Now let me give you a challenge. Some of you came in here this morning wearing a brand new walk with Christ. And I want to challenge you. Don't begin here and stop. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I want you to take one of those blue Bibles in the pew in front of you. Take that home. It's a gift for you. Read that. And it will walk through how to have a relationship with God that is real, that is transforming. And your faith will be real. Some of you rub shoulders with people every day. And God's been tapping you on the shoulder for some time. Hey, you need to invite them to church. Ah, they won't want to go to church. You need to invite them anyhow. Invite them to church. Some of you need to be involved in a life group or some kind of a small group. You say, oh, no, no, I'm too busy to do that. No, you're not. You're too busy not to do it. It will transform your life. I want you to get involved. This life of faith, this life of walking with Christ, is not a casual decision that we make on Sunday and then turn around and live our lives differently on Monday. It's a life that we make of intentional relationship with Christ seven days a week. Amen. Amen. And we want to help you learn what that looks like. How Christ can change your life. So I invite you. Come back again next week. Invite a friend. Take one of those Bibles. Read and understand what does it mean to have a relationship with Christ. Have a great week. Walk strong. God's blessing.